Um, yes, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and uh, hello again. So I'm going to give you my talk. And it's, it's somewhat provocatively called the C++ R value lifetime disaster. Well, I don't know if you will judge that it's a disaster. Um, you'll, you'll see at the end of the talk. I'll just tell you my view of the things, what I saw, and then you'll be the judge. So our values really came about because the standard library focuses a lot on value semantics. So everything that you do in the standard library has value semantics. That means when you are modifying something, then you are only modifying the object that you have in your hand, and you're not modifying anything else. And that means that whenever you are sharing an object, when you are, when you are, when you're putting an object somewhere else, you have to copy it. Because otherwise, you're, you're, if, if you just reference it, like we do in Java, for example, then when you modify the, the object, other people who are looking at the object would also see the change. And C++ didn't want that. They said, OK, it's much easier to reason about a program that uses value semantics. So um, they put that into the standard library. And the problem with it is that it leads to frequent copying. And that frequent copying was expensive. It cost performance. And so we said, OK, we need to come up with a solution. And the solution were our value references. And the idea is that you are no longer copying. Instead, you are moving. And the difference being is that if you know an object is not needed anymore, then you can kind of steal its resources. So if you, if you, if, here's an example. Um, you have a vector of vectors. And then you create a vector. And the vector creation allocates memory that contains the one, two, three. And then you want to append that vector onto the vector of vectors. And to do that, you, you um, move the vector into the destination so that the memory that you allocated, the one to three memory, gets reused for your moved instance inside the vector of vectors. So that's what basically our values were originally invented for. Now, they were also used already in C++11, but more now, to manage lifetime. The insight is that if something is an R value and you can steal the resources from it, well, why can you steal its resources? You can steal its resources because it will go out of scope soon. It will be gone soon. And no one is interested anymore in that, that value. Well, I mean, the fact that it will go out of scope soon by itself is an interesting piece of information. And that was actually used in C++11. It was kind of like a, a niche feature of the, of, the, uh, of the standard library, the stdcref that you use to wrap parameters to stdbind that you want to pass by reference. That one was only accepting L value references. If you gave it an R value, it would say, no, no, you cannot do this. In C++20, this using R value references for lifetime has become much more prevalent. Um, I don't know if you know C++, the C++ 20 ranges. Here is an example. I hope you can see it. Um, so you have a vector. And this vector gets, you, gets filtered. That means only certain elements of that vector actually are passing your, are actually in the, in the resulting filtered container. And the way this works is that this expression will generate an object that only references the vector, and its creation itself doesn't do anything. It doesn't filter the vector. The vector stays as it is. It's merely referenced, and it remembers the guy wants to filter the vector, the, the caller wants to filter the vector, and returns you an object, this range here, that you can then iterate over. And during this iteration, it will skip the elements that don't pass the filter. Now, since this object that contains the filter and the information that you want to filter has to reference the vector, if the vector would go out of scope, that would be bad. So what they did in the C++20 ranges is to say, well, if this thing that you're passing in here in the front is an R value, then this expression won't compile. Because they are basically, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. 
you, this, this object will go out of scope, and when you then take the, this filter object and iterate over it, it will reference a vector that is already gone. Now, before we look at this more closely, um, I want to go through some usages for using R-value references for performance. And we're going to do this uh, as a little quiz and see how well you know C++ and uh, whether you can tell me whether this is OK or not. OK, so let's start. You have an A, actually a const A, and you return it with std move. Who thinks that's good? Who thinks that's uh, good, that's bad? I want to see some hands. OK, so this is pretty easy, right? The, the, the problem here is that A is const, and uh, you cannot move out of const. So we make it non-const. Good now? OK, no. Why is it not good? It's not good because this moves. This moves the A. But um, we can do better, actually. So when you remove the std move, then you get something called named return value optimization, which is eliminating the move or copy altogether. The trick the compiler plays is that the A that gets, that's declared up here is actually put into the place of the return value. So it's, it is already the return value, the location where this return value should go. And so when you return it, the compiler doesn't need to do anything. It's already there. So the thing to remember here is that move sometimes makes things worse. Is this OK? With a const? Who thinks it's OK? Who thinks it's not OK? OK, at least I got some balance here. So I got you. So this is. By the standard, this is actually OK. This is still invoking named return value optimization. You will get the same code effectively as you did before without the const. Somewhat surprising, but that's, that's how the language is. Okay. Um, let's say you have two branches of an if condition. And each time you are returning your A, or two different A's, and each one is const. Is that OK? Not OK? Uh, I don't really know, right? No, it's not OK. This is actually not return, named return value optimization. The, the, the way to, to understand this is that basically the compiler is not terribly smart, or it's not demanded to be terribly smart by the standard. Named return value optimization will only kick in if you're returning a single object. You are, you are declaring a single object, the one object, and you are always returning it. And you have, may have some code in between, that's OK, but you only have a single return statement and you have a single declaration of what you're actually going to return in, in, that, uh, in, that, um, uh, in that return statement. So there's a single A, single return. And then since we don't have named return value optimization, we are back to moving, and we cannot really move because we have const. So this is bad. Oops, here we go. OK, so this is bad because we got const. Now, if we remove the const, then we get the move again, which is good, or as good as it can be in this particular case. Now, before we uh, continue, here's another one. Now, you have a structure B, and it aggregates an A. It's, not, it's no longer a plain A. You actually have um, it wrapped into a structure B. And now we play the same game. We have a B and we return BMA. Is that okay? Who thinks it's okay? Who thinks it's not okay? It's not okay. It's a copy. See, the, the whole return being movable business that we had before, the slide before, that only applies if, if your return statement contains that one variable. If it contains anything more complicated, it doesn't work. Okay, so the, the, the B is not automatically made an R value here because it's a ex more complicated expression. It's not just a, simple vari a single variable. Now, uh, what you can do is this. Is that okay? Okay? Not okay? It's okay. That's okay. You get a move. Why do you get a move? Because 
once the compiler or once, once the left-hand side of a, of a member access is an R value reference, then your, your member access is also going to be an R value reference. All right, now, what do we learn from all that? And it should really be a little bit higher. So, I tell you, um, first of all, I would recommend make all the return uh, variables non-const. This may work if you make them const, if you get na named return value optimization. But if you change the code around and suddenly you have two branches, it will break. So my recommendation is don't make them const. That's the general rule at, uh, at ThinkCell. And Clang, if you happen to develop under Clang, has a nice warning, uh, warning wmove. And well, that will warn you of all the wrong ways you can, you can use the std move. So if you just think, oh, the return needs to have a std move here, and you put it, on, put it in, and it's actually pessimizing, it actually makes things worse, then Clang will, will call it out to you. So uh, that's the other lesson. OK, um, now we come slowly to lifetime. Let's talk about a little bit of a niche feature of C++. Um, so you got a structure A, and that let's again aggregate it in a B, and you have an accessor that returns that A by reference. And then you write down there, auto const reference A equals B get A. So get A returns by reference, and you take it by reference. Okay, so far so good. Nothing magic. Now, let's say there's another structure, C. And that's different from B because it returns its A by value for whatever reason. So you got a B that returns by reference, and you got a C that returns by value. And you want to write common code. You want to write code, generic code, that works for both cases. Now, um, if you write this, auto constref A, constref it's a reference, and then you either plug in B or C, get A. Is that okay? Who thinks that's okay? Who thinks that's not okay? Okay, it's about half-half. Um, it's okay. And it's okay because there is this niche feature called temporary lifetime extension. That's not a C++11 thing. That has been in the language forever. And um, it basically says, if you are assigning a value to a reference, to in particular a const reference, it also works with our value references, then the, the, the lifetime of that value that you assigned will get extended to the end of the scope of the reference. It's kind of weird, um, but it, 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 the, it's, the idea behind it is nice. It's, you can write auto const ref, always. It, magic things happen, everything works fine. If you get a reference, you take a reference, and you don't have any, any performance hit, and if it happens to be a value, then it's a value. So what? Hmm. Let's see how well this works. So let's say our A is comparable. It's less comparable. And we now have a structure C. Uh, again, our structure C that returns A by value. And we have two of them. And we pick the lesser one. And want to put that into a variable. Should be OK, right? So we again write our auto constref. Right there. And uh, here we plug the two values into the std min. OK? Who thinks it's OK? Who thinks it's not OK? OK, there are quite a bit of majority that says not OK. No, it's not OK. The problem is, this is a standard conformant implementation of std min, um, that std min is actually taking the the things that it's comparing by const reference. So by the time it is leaving the min, and it returns here by const reference, right there, right? by the time the value is leaving the min, the fact that this is a value or an R value has long been forgotten. It's gone. It's just a const reference. So when you do your auto const up here, auto const A, the compiler doesn't see any need to do any lifetime extension it will just go out of scope. So you get a dangling A. Now, <clears throat> let's see wh whether we can improve this a little bit. Because stidmin, in my opinion, is really a little bit old schoolish implemented. It's a bit weird. 
Because now on the modern C++11 R, R value reference world, we are doing perfect forwarding, right? So let's, make it do, let's write a min that does perfect forwarding. And that may not cover all the cases, but it does cover our case where left-hand side and the right-hand side is really the same type. So you're getting the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Both are R-value references. And you just pick one of the two R-value references and return it. So now your, your our min is actually returning an R-value reference. The problem is A still dangles. Why? And here we are getting closer to the problems of C++. The temporary lifetime extension actually doesn't keep R value references alive. It does it for values, but for R value references, it doesn't do it. And it's very easy to turn a value into an R value reference. I mean, you just apply a std move, for example. If you just write std move, then suddenly the value has been turned into an R value reference. Hmm. And uh, then your temporary lifetime extension doesn't do it anymore. Now, there, there are, of course, reasons for that. I mean, internally, the compiler doesn't have a value at hand. It only has a reference. So it would need to create a copy instead of just keeping that copy it already has just for longer. So it's a bit of a different thing that we have to do in the compiler. But, uh, but still, I mean, when they invented R value references, this somehow fell through the cracks. They just uh, didn't do it. OK. Um, Let's see. Let, th there is another problem with temporary lifetime extension, uh, extensions that I want to get to, which is, say you have, again, two functions, uh, one that returns by value, and the other one turns by uh, value reference, const reference. And then it's relatively easy to write a function that takes that value and returns it, just moves it through. Right? So that looks like decal type auto foo returns some a. And here, it doesn't really matter what that sum A is. It may, this one, may be this one or that one. The function will work. Let's say we want to do some work in between. Okay? So um, you take the sum A, put it in the variable. You do something else, and then you want to return the A. How does the code have to look like for this to work? So uh, let's try this. First of all, we say decal type auto. Okay, so that we can relatively freely determine what our return value or return type should be. And uh, we kind of hope that temporary lifetime extension saves the day. Because, I mean, it will, if, it, if you get a value back, it will extend the lifetime of that value. Now, the problem is um, that if some A returns a reference, then uh, returns, some A returns a value, then the the fact that this is a value is, is not being used in the return A. As far as the language is concerned, that A is still a reference, and it will be returned as a reference. So um, if we alternatively say instead of decal type auto, we just say auto, well, as you may know, auto always decays. It always creates a value. So you always get a copy, which is not what we want. So how can we solve this? Um, the, the problem really is that I hate the temporary lifetime extension. I think it should be deprecated. We want to throw it out because it is lying to us. The temporary lifetime extension really turns something silently into a value. And since we have auto now in the language everywhere, we really should be, the, the compiler should help us that if you ask for the type of the variable, it should really tell us that it's a value, so we can reason about it in metaprogramming, that the right things happen. Right now, it's lying to us. It says it's a reference, but it's not really a reference. It's a value, and it behaves like a value. If it goes out of scope, it's gone. So if you ask me, deprecate li temporary lifetime extension. Don't use it anymore. It's bad. It has been bad since we introduced our value references. What we really want is a variable that we automatically where, where, we, where we automatically declare it as a value if we receive a value, and we automatically declare it a reference if we receive an L value reference. And R value references should also become values because they go out of scope pretty soon, so we need to keep them around. How can we build this? Well, right now you can only do it with macros. I'm very sorry, but that's how it is. 
So first of all, we build a little type function, decay r values, that whenever you give it an r value, it will actually decay. It will make it a value. If you give it an L value reference here, it will keep the L value reference. If you give it an R value reference, it'll turn it into a value. And then we have a macro that says, OK, whatever you're receiving here in the expression, the VARs, we'll check the decal type of it, append some R value reference, and then pump it through our type function that will make turn the R value references into a value. And that's really the, the uh, declare type of our variable. And then we just assign our expression, and all is good. Um, and if you do that for our little example, our foo, then uh, it will actually work. So the foo will take, take some a. a will be either be a value or will be a reference. And if it's a reference, it gets returned as a reference. If it's a value, it gets returned by a as a value. And if it's actually a value, it will actually get returned with named return value optimization. So you don't even incur any, over any overhead of returning that value. Um, pay attention that there are no parentheses around this expression here, the A. Because if you put parentheses around it, the, um, the, the decal type of that expression is going to be the expression type. And the expression type is always a reference. So not, not always, but if you, if you take the, decal the expression type of a variable, it will be an in a, a reference. So the A here is an L value reference. It plays the role of an L value reference if you put parentheses around it. If you don't put parentheses, you get the de declaration type. And the declaration type is what, well, what is, was declared as, and up here it was either declared as a value or a, a reference. All right, and then this works. Um, and we make this our default auto. We have this throughout our code, and it works beautifully. It works nicely. So it often when you, you know, otherwise you have to check, like, okay, is this thing returning by, by reference, or is it returning by value? And so it, do, we, do we cache this value already in the class, and then you can re return it by reference, or we always calculate it from scratch, then it's a value. And so if you use auto CREF, then you, you don't really need to think about it. Yes, uh, so I didn't show you that there are some smart extensions you can do um, to this type function. So one of the things that our DK, we don't use STIT DK, we use TCDK. You can, um, there is, if you go on Thinksell on, uh, to Thinksell on GitHub, there is our library. Um, and um, one of the things that we, where we basically scream is if you try to DK an array because um, you are not getting anything useful out of it. Um, there are other things you, you can do in a custom DK. Um, you could invent, for example, what we do um, is you have a ve the, 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 the beloved vector of bool, okay? With the beloved vector bool is it's, what it's returning are really proxy objects. They're not returning, if you, if you do a star it on a vector bool, you're not returning a, uh, you're not getting a reference to a bool. What you're getting is a, is a wrapper object that behaves like a bool, um, and, and you can assign to it, and internally it does some bit mangling, but this is a, a, a beloved example of, of, uh, of people who want to introduce proxies into the standard library. Now, if you decay such a thing, it is pretty clear that you're, you should be getting a bool because it's, it's the value that is in there. And if you valuefy that vector bool proxy, you want the bool out. Now, our DK does that. So there is some value having a custom DK function. And uh, that's the function you would use here. Um, now, there is another choice you have to make, which is when you write auto CREF, and you, it's a value, it happens to be a value. Should this value be const or non-const? Ours is const. Uh, that has the disadvantage that you have to have an extra auto CREF return if you want to use this, if it's logically const, but you want to use it in a return statement. 
and you want to move out of it. And unfortunately, there is no other way to do that in C++. If you want to return something, even if you don't change it, you have to make it non-const. So there's this uh, special thing, whether you want to you basically say, yeah, I'm, I'm not returning it, so you can really make it const, so that if I happen to modify it, the compiler will call it out to me and say, no, no, you're, this is supposed to be const, um, or whether you want um, it to be just convenient and say, well, I'm always writing auto CRF and it's non-const and I don't care. Anyway. So, um, let's see what, now if we have this, right, get, let's get back to our problem with this did min. So we have it again, the operator less, and uh, we have to get A's, and we pump this through our min, and, um, and we have our, sm our, the our min is the smart min that passes it through by our value reference, and then it's taken by auto C ref, and the auto C ref turns the R value reference into a value, and then everything works, okay? So um, if you put all this machinery in place, it's okay. Hmm. Let's uh, dig a little bit deeper into the language. So again, you have our A, and you have a B that aggregates the A, and you're writing something like uh, you, you assign the A here to a, to a variable. Now, what does this do? Where you already said that a member access of an R value is itself an R value. So the A in this case is going to be a value. So the decal type of, of this expression here, the member access, is A reference, A R value reference, and then A, the auto C ref, will turn that into a value. So all good. Let's look at something else, and things start to get ugly. Let's say the MA shouldn't be public. We want to keep it private and write an accessor function, what we do all the time. Right, per most perfectly normal thing in the world. Well, the problem is get A returns by constref. And now you got, you got a B, which is an R value reference. You say B, get A, and you get an R value reference. Uh, you get, a, you get the, the get A still returns a constref, an I value reference. So the B was an R value, but um, your get A is now an L value reference. And auto C ref does the wrong thing. It gives you a const ref, which is dangling. That's pretty bad. Now you may think, well, there is this newfangled, I can put an ampersand after my uh, member function. This is now the, the way to declare member functions which are R value restricted. And, but the const ref actually happens to be the same thing as it was before. I, if you write const or const ref, it doesn't matter at all. The, the problem is that the const ref binds to everything. I shouldn't put the most important things at the bottom. Um, the, the, the problem is the const ref binds to anything. So it, it binds to R values. So if the B is an R value, you can still call this const ref here, the const ref get A. And then you get a const ref A back. And uh, well, and then you have a dangling reference. This is pretty fundamental. This affects any accessor function we write. This problem is in gazillion times in all C++, language, uh, C++ programs. That's how we write accessor functions. That's kind of unfortunate. Now, let's look at what, it, what the language does with this thing, with this problem. Um, let's say we have two functions, L and R. An L returns an L value reference of A. An R returns an R value reference to A. Now, as you can imagine, if you have now the ternary operator, you either take one or the other, and both are L value references, you get an L value reference back. Both are L value references, get an L value reference back. So far, so logical. You have an R value reference, and you have two R value references, you get an R value reference back. Well, that's quite natural as well. So what if you mix the two? If you say, I either get an L value reference or an R value reference. Now, what's the type of that expression? Who thinks it's an L value reference? Who thinks it's an R value reference? Who thinks it's something else? <laughs> it's a const. I don't know why. No idea, but that's what it is. 
you, it makes you think that when they designed this thing, they already thought, oh my god, we, I think we have a problem here. I mean, constrefref binds to constref, right? So, so that's, that, that somehow should be okay, but if we do that, then we get an L-value reference, and, and then this, this whole thing of, of lifetime just goes away. So we can't really do that. We don't want to do that. Let's, we, let's make it a value. If you make it a value, nothing can go wrong. It's, it's kind of safe. So let's make it a value. So we make it a value. It's a const value, because both are const. Go figure. And C++ forces a copy, right? In, in this time, you always get a copy, because both are references, and you get a new A created, which is a copy of one of the two. OK, um, C++ 20 has kind of the same functionality in disguise. They had the following problem. With these um, ranges, you often merge together the, um, the inputs or, or the outputs of two ranges. So you have one thing that when you iterate, produces an L-value reference, and the other thing that you iterate over produces an R-value reference. Okay, and with ranges, that's, that's entirely possible. And then there are things that are called, uh, that, that merge or join, where you basically take two ranges and kind of put them together. You, you either interleave them, you, so they are sorted, so they kind of get, get like a ladder, they, the elements get walked over according to their order, or they get just concatenated. Either function is fine. In both cases, you have an iterator whose output is either the iterator output of one range, or it's the iterator output star it of the other range. So you, you run star it on your joined range, and then internally it decides, okay, I have to run star it on this range, or I have to run star it on that range. And each of these iterators has a different return type. So it is perfectly feasible that one returns a constref and the other one an R value reference. So again, we play our game. So a constref and a constref. What is it? It's a constref. Const R value reference to const R value reference. What's that? That's a const R value reference, just like what we had before with the ternary operator. Again, what's this? What's, let me mix the two. Ha. It's an L value reference. It thinks it's fine. I don't care. It's all right. So um, ah, you would think, you know, kind of a const ref is kind of a, 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 an R value reference. We said already, it's kind of similar to a value, right? In auto C ref, we turned the R value reference to a value. So what's the common reference of an A const and an A const ref? Hmm, it's an A. <laughs> I don't know. So um, summary is, they really love, and this is uh, how I call it, it's R-value amnesia. This kind of, you have an R-value reference, or an R-value, and you just kind of forget. It's like, ah, oh, whatever, it's L-value reference. Let's make an L-value reference. Um, and common reference really likes that. Which brings us to the point, what is correct? What do we want to do? If we had, basically, would have to design it all from scratch and we would do it right, what would we do? Um, so, here's what we would do. First of all, let's think about um, the, what are the promises that a particular type of reference makes? What do we expect from a reference, of a, a particular reference type? Well, first of all, there are R-value references and L-value references. And as we've seen, the R-value references have a short lifetime, L-value references have a long lifetime. Okay. And then there's mutability, of course. Const references we can mutate, and uh, const references are not immutable, and normal references we can mutate. Currently, this is our world of references. And I left out volatile because, I mean, volatile is used really, really rarely, and some people already say we should deprecate it. And there is one other thing, one other promise. If you had an R-value reference, you can actually scavenge from it. You can steal the resources. Um, and you can steal the resources without doing any harm. So there's an operation you can only do on R-value references. And this is what C++ is currently doing. So these are the binding rules of the current C++. So everything built binds to a constref, 
and the const ref ref binds to a constref, and the r value reference binds to a constref, and okay, the r value reference binds also to a const r value reference. But these are the current rules. And as you can see, there are arrows going from short lifetime to long lifetime, which is weird. Why would you do that? I mean, I'm, I'm the, the, uh, something that basically doesn't promise a long lifetime suddenly is converted into something that pro promises a long lifetime. And then, they, of course, this thing cannot fulfill this promise. So it's kind of, why do you do that? In order to fix it, we have to turn some arrows around. We should do it this way. So everything but can bind to a const R value reference. Because the const R value reference doesn't promise anything. It has the minimum number of promises. So anything can bind to it, no harm done. And constref only L values can actually bind to. So we go for less lifetime. We go for less mutability. You can always bind something mutable to something const and less scavengeability. Um, otherwise, you may be tempted to say, OK, an L value reference can, can moonlight as an R value reference. But, but of course, that's not true, because the scavengeability, would, if, you, if you rip stuff out of that reference, then other people may see it and say, oh, that's weird. Someone changed that, that, uh, that object. OK. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do now? <laughs> it's so terrible. It's terrible. Hmm. OK. I thought about how we can fix it. And this is very, very preliminary. I haven't implemented it, and I just thought about it on my desk. And, and I think what we need to do is, if we want to do something, we need to implement it. We need to basically show to the world that it works. Um, and before we haven't done that, we don't even need to go to the standard committee and, and say anything, because they will just laugh at us. Um, so what can we do? First of all, what are the requirements? Well, as always in C++, existing code must continue to work. You cannot say, oh, you have to throw away all our code. That's never going to work. Um, in particular, also, you have to be able to mix code. You have to say, well, you have an existing library that's my wonderful linear algebra library or whatever, uh, and it's been written according to old rules, and I don't want to throw it away. Although maybe my own code, I can gradually work towards new rules. So the idea is any reference either, either uses the new rules or the old rules. And these rules are binding rules. So as soon as the reference is generated, has come into existence, this old versus new is irrelevant. Just at the moment of binding, that's where the new versus old happens. And that's why we also don't need to change the type system. We are fine with L values and R values, all good. We just introduce a, a little pragma that says, OK, from now on, new bounding rules apply. And then basically every, every declaration of a reference inside this new rules apply block, they get a little tick and says, if, if, if something is binding to you, you apply the new rules. So what are we talking about? Just to have a practical, like an idea of, of, of what are the things that we are actually binding to? What are the things where, where references are being declared? And I, I made this list. If you come up with any other places in the language, um, let me know. But this is what I came up with. So we have local global variables and initialization. That's kind of the, the plain vanilla part. Somewhat more obscure, you have structured binding. Um, you have function lists, function parameter lists, lambdas that have parameters. There we declare references. Um, we have members that are declared inside structs, and they may be filled either by aggregate initialization, or we have members that are filled by constructors. And then we have lambda captures. That's all I pretty much came up with, where in the language we are declaring references. Now, and here are the, here's how it would look like then. You're basically having, you, you declare your A outside of the block as an int constref. Then inside the block, we have an int constref. That's a B, B int constref. And a C is an R value reference. And here is the first, with there you have the B again. The, these were declarations. And now here you have the definition. But the B was declared inside as with, with, with new rules, and here you would have one with old rules because it's outside of the block. I would say, well, that's weird. Let's throw an error. That's a strange thing that's happening here. 
Um, so how would you then, what, how would it behave when you call these functions? And this is all outside of the block. So, the, so basically, it's, it's where the variable declaration is, is what matters. So when you, when you run a, a of 5, then that would compile, because that, that's the old rules. That's all fine. The B5 is an L value reference. Well, that's exactly what we wanted to avoid, right? We have an R value. That's the 5. So this cannot compile, because we're binding R value to an L value. The C5 is an R value, as an R value const reference. R value const reference is the, the, the new lowest common denominator. That was the const ref before. So this actually compiles, just as this one. So if you just declare a variable, that's an L value. Now the L value would bind to the R value here. Would be OK. All right. Um, how would that impact programs in particular? How would it impact the standard library? So first of all, you probably want some feature test macro. You want to know whether this thing is enabled or not. If you write more sophisticated code, you probably need to be able to find out uh, which mode you're in. Um, the functions that you write are, are, I think, pretty easy to convert, because you would essentially do a search and replace and say everything that is a L value reference now, we just turn into an R value reference. That, that would functionally be the same. Everything binds to it. That's what the current function that we have. So, so doing that for, 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 uh, to, to convert code is per se safe. You had a const ref that was binding everything before. Now you have a const ref ref, R value reference, and it's also binding everything. So it's OK. It's the same thing, equivalent uh, transformation. Um, interesting are the places in the standard library that kind of do calculations on types. Um, because functions you can always implement equivalently. But of course, when you calculate types, um, well, the outcome may change according to, which, according to which rules you're acting. And the only thing that I could find is really that common reference where it really makes a difference. Uh, everything else is not affected. I mean, if you're staying add const or remove const or anything like, it just does what it did before. Now, before we do this, OK, um, well, we need to write an implementation in Clang, which is going to be hard. Um, and until then, until that day, we need to somehow mitigate the problems we have. We need to do something in our existing code right now n so we don't run into these problems. What can we do? Well, first of all, I already said, throw out the temporary lifetime extension. It's bad. Replace it by auto CREF. Um, you basically need to guard all your member accessors. Whenever you're writing a member accessor, delete the R value equivalent. Just take it out. It's, it's dangerous. I mean, I know that C++ is full of boilerplate. We are writing always like, you know, it's like we always have to write const, and now we have to write no except, and we have to write gazillion things just to do the normal thing. You have to add this stuff. But here's another one. You have to delete the R value accessor. Maybe you want to do a macro for it? We have a macro for it. I know macros are bad, but what are you going to do? Um, here's our common reference. So um, basically, it's, it's a, a, the std common reference that where, you, where you define away the bad stuff. So you're basically saying, OK, it's just like before, like the old common reference. But then I'm checking, is, is my old type, is that an L value reference? And anywhere in my list, is an R value reference. If there is a value, then that's not a problem, because then the common reference is also going to be a value. But if it's an R value reference, we are potentially in trouble, as we've seen. And then, hey, let's take the reference away from whatever this old common reference calculated, the L value reference, and append R value reference. So we turn the L value reference into an R value reference if, you th if we think it's dangerous. Um, when we do that, we can actually fix a up a bunch of stuff. I, we already saw here that the decal type of R and L, again, right, this is R value reference, this is L value reference, ternary operator is an A const where we get forced to copy, which we may not want. Well, we can actually fix that by using our common reference. So we write again a macro that casts, before it does that, that, uh, that ternary operator, it casts this on the common reference. And then um, when we do that, and then use the cond conditional macro on the same input as the ternary operator up here, 
then we get an Acons ref ref out, which is arguably what we want. And there's no immediate copy. You can still decide then with an auto CREF, do we want to copy it? Do we need to valuefy because this thing is going to go out of scope pretty soon? Or you don't want to um, because you're passing it only to a function and then a const ref ref may be just fine. So here's the summary. Um, the const ref should have never bound to our values. It's unfortunate that it happened. And I think it's maybe possible to fix. I think it won't break too much code, but the proof has to be there. So we need a client implementation, and, uh, and then we need a large code base to try it on. And if I have a long client implementation, I will certainly try it on the things like code base, um, whether that works. And uh, until then, we have to do with various mitigations. Thank you. And questions, I think. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have some questions. Yeah, could you please uh, show the piece of code which is actually valid right now and will break with your approach? Oh. Uh, you don't have such an example. I, we, I don't have an example. I mean, in, uh, you mean with the with the C plus uh, plus with with the proposed fix up yeah, for yeah, C yeah, plus plus? Yeah. I don't. Th I mean, yeah. If you have existing code per se, there is going to be a trans. Well, do you are you going to break existing code? Yes, you're going to break a lot of existing code because every time you have a const ref in a function parameter, mm -hmm. and that's probably the most common thing that you will break is whenever you're passing in an R value to such a function, it won't compile anymore. Okay. Right? I mean, and that's going to be, there are going to be gazillion examples of that. And I think you can pretty much fix that by saying, okay, a regular expression, if this is showing up in a function body, if in a function parameter list, co convert the const ref into a const ref ref. Because inside the body, an R value behaves like an L value, as we know. So it is not really a problem. So, so all you really need is you need to turn around the parameter lists. And what you need to do beyond that, I, I, haven't, I don't know. I haven't tried. So, um, but I, I, th I, think it's, I think it's doable. OK, yeah. The next question was, after CRF, it doesn't work with aggregates until C++20. Am I right? Because you will need to use like uh, braces and you use macro. So it what, what will it say again? The auto CRF? Uh, auto CRF doesn't work with aggregates, yeah? So if you use uh, braces, you cannot use macro because the macro will break. Um, and well, but then you wouldn't, you wouldn't copy a single value. I mean, when you're assigning a single value, even yeah. if you're assigning it to an aggregate, you do it with equality. So there, it's, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't really apply. I mean, if, you are, if you're running a regular constructor on a type, then yeah. you wouldn't use auto CREF. Or your CREF you use ah, okay. when you take a copy of a If you have some value and you want to assign it to a variable, that's when you use auto CREF. Um, there was one thing I think I didn't mention it. Auto CREF won't work right now in C17. It won't work if the expression contains a lambda. Because there is this obscure rule that you cannot e evaluate the type of, of, a, of a lambda. You cannot use lambda in an unevaluated context. Mm -hmm. This will go away with C20, and then you can do it. Um, there's a bit of extra macro machinery you can do to make it work right now, but I'm not sure it's worth it. With C20, the problem will go away. Okay, yeah, and the last question, yeah, uh, what, yeah you have an option to like opt in or opt out of the new behavior you propose. Uh, for example, if I have a function uh, declaration and I have somewhere some reference declaration and like I had this opt-in into places so for, for, for this particular case what like I, I need to see everything in uh, I need to declare in, in every piece of code I declare a function I need to have the same option and it will be ODR or I, I think you have um, I mean Basically, I think it will be like, like your, your JavaScript strict. 
you know, that you put on top of every function and say, okay, this, this, uh, uh, the new rules apply, the safe rules apply. In practice, that's going to be how it's working. So you do your includes, and some of your includes may include stuff that is, is still to, according to the old rules, but uh, when you actually come to the meat of your function or your, your, your meat of your file, then you say, okay, I'm going to switch on the new rules. Um, and and it's, it's, it's going to be interoperable with all the other code because it's going to be basically your references that where, where the, new, the new rules apply. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly local. Does it break ABI somehow or...? No, no. the ABI only cares whether it's a reference or not. It doesn't care about R values or L okay. values or it's just a point or a pointer. I mean, a reference, a pointer or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Okay. For not, for not as far as the ABI is concerned. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>